Welcome back to today's Master Coaches Wednesday Weekly Buzz. My name is Bob Batucci, and I am joined by fellow Master Coaches, Kathy George, Mick Haley, and Bill Walton. Our topic for today is Volleyball Day in Nebraska. The recognition of an event held last Wednesday, August 30th, 2023, an event that made national and international news. On that night at Memorial Stadium, at the University of Nebraska's football stadium, the University of Nebraska hosted Volleyball Day in Nebraska, the match between the University of Nebraska Lincoln and the University of Nebraska Omaha. That was attended by a record-breaking crowd of 92,000 fans. That crowd of more than 92,000 also surpassed what is widely regarded as the world record attendance for women's for any women's sporting event. And that was previous, previously a record held during the Women's Champion League soccer match at uh, Barcelona, Spain. Previous to that, the American women's sporting event that held 90,185 90, was the FIFA World Cup soccer final in 1999 at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena. Now this record is held by a women's collegiate volleyball match. Today's guest, Dr. Jamie Gordon, the executive director of American Volleyball Coaches Association and former athletic director of Moorhead State University is our guest. And without further ado, uh, Jamie, uh, welcome, welcome to Master Coaches Wednesday Weekly Buzz. Hey, Bob, thanks. It's uh, great to be back with you all. I uh, appreciate the invitation, so I must not have done too horrible of a job last time. Uh, happy to join with you. <laughs> no, we're glad to have you here. Uh, I'm going to start things off, uh, Jamie. I, you know, and again, thank you for being here. I know you're, you're traveling. You've been on the road for over a week. You were at this match, and I let our listeners have a sense of what it felt like to be at a volleyball match with 92,000 fans. I have to say there were multiple times during the event that I got choked up, um, and I wasn't the only one. Um, there were people around me, um, and the, the, the weight of that event and what it meant um, to women's athletics, um, to volleyball, um, even to the University of Nebraska, um, it was it was evident there. Um, the uh, university did an unbelievable job with the, their production of it. Um, the event was a first class event. It, it made me feel like I was um, it reminded me of a Final Four uh, men's basketball Final Four uh, in a dome and with the, the, the game on a stage and everybody around them. Um, the, the military flyover. Uh, it was it was pretty spectacular. And one of the things that I, I, I want to make sure doesn't get lost with this event is that this was very organic. Um, you know, the initial focus um, that, that John uh, Cook and Trev Albers, their uh, athletic director, was to, to regain the regular season title back from Wisconsin. And so by doing this, it would give them a shot at maybe 20, 25, 30,000 was their like dream goal. And as soon as those tickets went on sale, uh, they just had to open up more section after section after section. So this wasn't the result of some brilliant marketing scheme. Um, I think this was a very uh, organic and evident um, event that shows the, the strength and the power of volleyball right now. And it got, as you mentioned, um, national news. The next day, it was on all three morning shows. Uh, the day, today show was their lead. It was picked up by NPR, the um, New York Times, Forbes magazine. So um, it was beyond the normal sporting uh, media outlets. Um, it was it was popular um, news. And um, as I've been going through airports and things like that, um, it, it's not, um, I don't have too many strides before I have somebody comment, oh, did you see what happened in Nebraska? You see what happened with volleyball? Um, so uh, it, it's a really special moment and one that I, I think we're going to be reliving and, and remembering and um, kind of looking back at a, at a potential watershed moment for, for our sport. Well, that, that's kind of the 
other part to my question, you know, how would you categorize this event, you know, uh, in the scope of women's collegiate volleyball? Uh, you know, I think the athletic director might have come out and said after the event, we didn't even need to have a, a concert or, you know, or this thing or that thing. The volleyball match did it on its own. Yeah, I, I think that's, I think, and that's what's got a lot of people's attention. Um, I had the pleasure of spending uh, a lot of the day with, with Charlie Baker, who's the new president of the uh, NCAA. Um, uh, we had invited him uh, to be a part and to experience it. Some of his staff uh, was along and um, I can say, and I've mentioned this in a couple of different places, Charlie Baker is a volleyball fan. Actually, when I picked him up at the airport, um, he had his phone out and was like, hey, I've got this great play from last year's tournament. And it was South Dakota and like Houston. And he starts showing this play where the libero is running into the the, uh, the, the the press table and playing and stuff like that. So, you know, there, there's the excitement of the sport. And then when you start to see, hey, here's what, the potential future of this sport can be and, and where the investment um, can come into, because I, I think this is the other part that is getting a lot of um, notice is the, that volleyball has gotten to this point without a whole lot of investment, um, without a tremendous amount of pull from a male counterpart. Um, it is women's volleyball that is driving um, this, this bus and this train and moving these things forward. And I think it's starting to, get people's attention in really big decision-making positions of, well, what could this be if we make some investment in it? What could this be if we start to separate our championship um, away from the media rights package? What could this be if we start looking at uh, corporate championship partners um, specifically for the volleyball uh, event and, and not have it just packaged with the men's basketball sponsorships? And so, um, you know, women's basketball has seen a, a, a tremendous growth, um, but that's also after 25 years of significant investment that that's finally made that click of, of last year's watershed. And so for us to see that, um, again, just on the backs of, of you all, and I hope that um, Mick and Bob and Bill and Kathy, um, that you are taking uh, pride in this moment because it's a, it's a result of the foundation that you all have laid for this sport so that um, you know, people in our positions now are, are able to enjoy it. You know, it's, it's funny you say that, Jamie, because, um, you know, I hate to age myself, but I was really at the very beginning of um, college scholarships from the NC2A and, and starting this all off. And you think about men's sports that have started in the early 1900s and the momentum um, that they've had over the years, but look at how fast volleyball is moving. And um, I'd like to say also that last year, women's volleyball was the number three sport um, behind football and basketball for viewership um, on, uh, you know, television and through streaming and all of those things. And so the momentum is real. And what you're talking about is it really wasn't just um, to, to follow anybody else, but it's really just kind of what's been going on without as much without as much push. What do you, you know, what do you think or do you see the effect of this experience, which, by the way, I cried to um, <laughs> watching it. It was like it was so it was just it was so here, you know, and to see what was happening. What do you think is going to come from this or what have you heard? Yeah, you know, I think, again, as I, I had mentioned, it, I think especially at the NCAA level, um, they see this opportunity. And that's, you know, a, a big part with any large association is where do we have opportunities to grow? Where do we have opportunities to grow uh, attention? Where do we have opportunities to grow revenue? Um, and with over the last several years, the just in general women's athletics and, and how it's become more front and center, um, volleyball has really shown itself as as really a great buy. So if you're looking at this like a stock, I mean, volleyball is an incredible value stock uh, because you can get in um, kind of at the, the low level, and it has a, a super high trajectory um, here. I think another part that gets, um, you know, we see these attendance numbers, and it's not just Nebraska. Um, you know, I think Cincinnati opening weekend had a record crowd. South Florida had a record crowd. You know, we're seeing in multiple places around that are, are disassociated from from Lincoln that they're seeing those those um, things. But, you know, the big network, our Big Ten network, which uh, kudos to them, they did an outstanding job of the, the production of that event as well. It showed outstanding on TV. Um, they're making investments in, in volleyball. 
but that broadcast had the second most viewership um, in the Big Ten um, history for, for volleyball. I think it was Nebraska and Wisconsin on um, Black Friday as they were battling for, for a championship that had just a slight uh, bit more um, viewership. And the other thing that I think is getting the attention of you know, businesses who are looking to invest in NCAA that's looking out 10, 20 years uh, in the future is that our demographic of viewership is young. Um, it is one of the youngest demographics that you're seeing. It is also one of the higher percentages of female. Um, so what um, any good business analyst is looking at is saying, wow, this is a young group. So we've got a lot of history there, but they're also seeing the sentimental value of volleyball, of mothers and daughters going to events, fathers and daughters going to events. You know, this is what was the, the backbone of like baseball. Um, is that father and son going to the ball game and, and things like that. And so to, to look and see, hey, where can this, what's the sustainability of this sport 10 and 15, 20 years away, you've got an incredible um, foundation of your, of your fan base as well. You know, Jamie, um, moving forward a little bit, uh, Terry Pettit, the former coach at Nebraska, uh, was quoted, uh, I believe, on Twitter. Uh, as ur urging coaches not to try to copy this kind of thing, but to move forward in trying to increase the number of fans in maybe bigger venues or the venues that they're playing in to get more people to be able to see the game. Jared Elliott came out uh, Sunday or Monday in the Austin American Statesman suggesting that the next place to go for him might be the new Moody Center with 16,000 seats. He plays in a very packed 6,000 seat arena if, if he can get that many in there. And Pettit played in the Coliseum for so long. And we tried to get him to get out of the Coliseum because Nebraska was such a hot spectator base. What's your thought on the way the coaches should go forward after an event like this? Yeah, I think, well, if there's anybody we should listen to on this, it's Terry Pettit. I mean, he, he really built that foundation um, for that program. And um, I agree with him 100%. Um, the, you know, and, and really, I think there's a tremendous model in the Nebraska, um, you know, kind of, I'm going to say phenomenon, because it, it, it takes real uh, effort in, in building grassroots. Um, and that's, um, you know, with when they were in Memorial Coliseum, and, and it was such a hard ticket. And then there was some question of like, oh, when they go to Devaney, does that change things? Does it, is it gonna, you know, are they gonna be able to fill it? And of course, right away, it's a, it's a hard sell. You know, I'm, I'm interested to see, I, I've not had a chance to talk to John Cook about this. You know, they've got the, the Pinnacle Bank uh, arena right there in Lincoln. Is that something um, that has future for them? But, but I agree, we need to, to make sure that we build up where we, we are, be strong there, create that foundation, and then, you know, step, step on. But, but I, I think that, uh, you know, and again, uh, I, I saw, I didn't get a chance to, to say hello to Terry, um, but I'm sure he was incredibly proud uh, on, on last Wednesday and, and just to see what has come just from, from the efforts that he placed uh, into that program and into that sport. So, so Jamie, so, would you, do you think that, that maybe the focus shouldn't be to chase the, the football stadium concept but make sure that each individual university is getting into their bigger facility on campus and selling that and, and trying to fill that facility as a first step. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think, I think what you've got to do is, you know, and, it, and it's funny, I was, I spent some time with the NCAA staff and we were joking cause I was like, Hey, um, we better be moving our championships into domes because we've got a new uh, bid process cycle going through. And I, I kind of meant it in a joking way but there is some some at some point you've got to figure out okay what are those next steps what does the the capacity build but i think you've got to be strong at where you are so to mix point with Jarrett, um absolutely they've done a great job of, of creating a high demand there so maybe they are ready to make that next step um but i wouldn't shoot you know too high i saw a little article um i think it was yesterday where uh Dave Shondell was, I think, kind of joking that I, I think it was, I mean, maybe it was serious, but that the way that they could beat that was to play it at the uh, um, Indianapolis Motor Speedway, that that would be a good way to get 150 or 300,000 
people at that. So, but, you know, I think to, to, to that point, you know, you know, Purdue is playing and they're crushing it. And they've got a great environment at their place, but, but can they move to Mackey and, and start to build that same type of environment? And, and I think now's the time to, to start pushing that and pushing our administrators to say, Hey, this is time. This is the right time to invest. So speaking of pushing, uh, Coaches uh, that are successful are normally pushers. Some are well-skilled and can communicate a little bit better. But honestly, my athletic director never wanted to see me coming in the door because I was always asking for something. I was trying to push to the next level. A lot of coaches feel like athletic directors are so busy that their schedule is so filled that they really don't want to see you, that, that they want you to manage that program and, and good luck and win if you can, but I've got bigger fish to fry here because it, it's fall and it's football season. You've been an athletic director. How do you how do you coach the coaches to approach the athletic directors on going to the next level? How do you how do you make a point? Does this ninety two thousand make a point that maybe volleyball is a revenue producing sport, and we should start having a, a plan down the road? Or how we're going to increase this? How how would you how would you talk to the coaches about this? Yeah, I, I think um, and Mick, you're exactly right. And I, 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 even as somebody who's a volleyball person, as an AD, you have certain things that you're focused on, and there's <clears throat> tremendous pulls and draws from football and, and basketball. Um, and so this, I, I, and, and I'll, I'm kind of tie this into what's next um, after this event, and that is. We've got to work at this from top down and bottom up. And so from the top down from the NCAA, when, when they start saying, hey, we're going to make this investment, that matters coming down to administrators. Um, there's a reason that also there's a lot of investment in women's basketball is because at the NCAA level, there's a lot of investment in women's basketball. Um, there's a lot of investment in men's basketball. So if we see that investment happening at the top, then to your point, Nick, we've got to be prepared to have that conversation and be ready to say, hey, these are the standards of what um, excellence in our sport looks like. This is the standard of a, of, of a game um, production. This is what marketing looks like. This is what um, community engagement um, looks like. And here's some, some patterns. Here's some examples of, of how this, this happens. And we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, we just need to make sure that we're adapting the wheel to our specific um, areas and, and markets. And so whether it's a mid-major program like Moorhead State that has a tradition um, or Creighton who's doing great jobs or it's Nebraska, Texas, uh, Wisconsin, um, we've got to all, all kind of think about how do we continue to, to move that. But the a key piece for this in that conversation with administrators is the investment at the top um, from the NCAA. And I, I really, and I'm just optimistic, but I, I believe that that they're ready to do that. Well, I said to the to these guys earlier when we were preparing for the show, I just uh, was really, I don't know, thrilled about the fact that, you know, John probably has this idea. Let's, uh, you know, let's win this attendance award. And <laughs> by the way, let's just do this football thing. Let's put it in a football field. And AD goes, yeah, let's do that. I believe that, you know, and everybody just went for it. So I think that uh, that sends sends a message that, you know, you, you can do great things and get behind things. And uh, certainly they put themselves in a position to um, do that. So I have to say you met the AD there. Yes. Yes. Just real quickly in, pa in passing. Um, but uh, yeah, they, and uh, their chancellor, um, you know, from the very top of the president believed in it as well. Um, yeah. you know, they, I, I got a chance to spend a little bit of time with, with, the, with the chancellor there um as well and you know they believed in it and and so it wasn't a it's funny it wasn't a surprise to them from the top down um well, that's what we all want to want to hear <laughs> it's good stuff <laughs> fun but Back to um, you, Bob. Yeah. all right well jamie uh you know just we we really appreciate you coming on i i know you're you're, you're you have to catch a, a plane so you know we we don't want to hold you too long uh, but we 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 did uh, want to have you back again, all right. We want to we want to talk about conference realignment and how that impacts volleyball, and we surely want to talk about the AVCA convention that's coming up this year in, in Tampa. In fact, my understanding is 
the NCA has already sold out all the tickets for the event. Great. So that means coaches need to join the ABCA convention because that's their only way to get a ticket right now. Pretty, pretty much. And, and, you know, Bob, you, you mentioned it. I was going to kind of throw it in there, but I, I think we're going to, you know, see this as being a very historic season for volleyball um, in, in what was kind of bookmarked at, at, at in Lincoln and then down to Tampa, because, um, as you mentioned, they are almost sold out, and their capacity is 19,600 and change. Um, right now, the championship record is 18,775 um, in Columbus. So we're going to see another record more than likely be broken by attendance uh, at our championship that's being um, broadcast on ABC, and it's in Tampa. It's, not, it's outside of Big Ten country. Um, it is going enough. to an entirely, yeah, it's going to an we entirely different region. Yeah, and, and crushing it. And so <laughs> I, I think it just shows well uh, what we can do. <laughs> and we well, surely don't want to have the championship in Buccaneers. a stadium in Omaha in December. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe something down in, in Miami or something like that we'll, we'll, we'll look at. <laughs> Well, again, Jamie, thanks very much. A safe travels, and we'll look forward to seeing you in Tampa. All right. Thanks, thanks, y'all, okay. and uh, thanks for Thank having you. me. Right. Thank you, Bye -bye. Jamie. <clears throat> well, let me go ahead and uh, introduce our, our next guest, All right. uh, Coach Danny Busboom Kelly, head coach at the University of Louisville. She arrived at Louisville in 2017, where she made an immediate impact. Her team was picked to finish eighth in the ACC in the preseason poll and ended up competing for the ACC championship. And she's, and she's continued to garner success ever since then. She has been the 2017 AVCA East Regional Coach of the Year, 2018 uh, USA Collegiate National Team coach and won, won the Europe gold medal. 2019 USA High Performance coach. 2020 and 21 ABC <laughs> East Regional <laughs> Coach of the Year. I know this is this is unbelievable. It's a long one. Yeah. 2021, 2022. Uh, 2022 was the National Coach of the Year. Uh, you know, Kath, I'm, you know, I've coached for 45 years and Danny has, has, has gotten more done in five or six years than I have done in 45 years. It's unbelievable. And she's a rock star. Oh, she, she <laughs> she's killing it. All right. Now, and, and, and prior to coming to, to Louisville, uh, and, and it's important for today's discussion, uh, coach, Kelly was an assistant coach at the University of Nebraska, as well as a player. So let's welcome Danny to Master Coaches Wednesday Weekly Buzz. Oh, thank Hi, you guys. For I hope we didn't embarrass you at all that, but <laughs> it is pretty phenomenal what you've accomplished. You're clearly a leader in you know a leader for women in the sport right now. Well, I appreciate that. Um, it's been a lot of fun, that's for sure. So definitely still enjoying every day and, you know, going for more records, I guess, more records and more like breaking barriers. That's so cool, Danny. And I'm looking at you in your hotel room and I know that you guys have a match tonight at uh, Dayton. So you've probably been getting ready for that. Absolutely. You know, it's a, we started a little stretch of some tough matches and as everybody, you know, ramps up the non-conference. So um, it'll be a tough one tonight. Dayton looks really good. So I, yeah. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't nervous, a little nervous <laughs> about this one. Well, you know, if it's not a little nerves, you know that you're not ready, right? So it's exactly. you always have that little thing, that little edge. <laughs> exactly. 100%. So Danny, I remember watching you as a player, you know, and uh, just a pistol and you, played hard and drove your team to winning and it was just awesome to watch. And then to see what you're doing as a coach, um, you really are doing a great job. So real proud of that. Uh, wanting to ask, like you had to have a different, like you have a position that nobody else has, you know, you've been a player, you've been an assistant and you're watching this and I'm sure you weren't there because you were busy, but uh, you're watching this. Tell me what you felt like, what were your emotions? Well, I was pretty, uh, 
I don't I don't know why it surprised me. So I, I'm going to say I was surprised, but it's weird because I don't know how you keep underestimating Husker Nation and what Nebraska does for the sport of volleyball, but just really blown away from like how it came together and the the event and how amazing it looked on TV and I don't know, it was it was really incredible to be an alum and to to see that Nebraska still takes volleyball seriously. It's like they've already done a lot for the sport. And it's like, no, that's not enough. We're going to do more. And definitely a very proud, proud moment. Yeah, you know, you, you you watch that and you think, okay, first of all, you know, there was the attendants juggling back and forth and seeing what they could do. But you're right. Um, they just stepped up again. And, and I'm just curious as to what do you think that this event has on all these other collegiate programs, including yours and everybody else that's saying, hey, this is, they can do this. What can we do and how do we use that? So what do you see coming forward from it? You know, I, I've just seen a lot on social media, mainly of other ADs, you know, retweeting or posting about their volleyball programs. And I think that it really opened people's eyes and that was really important for our sport. And I hate to say it, but we continue to be underestimated a little bit as a sport in a whole as a whole it's like when are people going to wake up and stop underestimating us and to keep pushing it forward because there's very few times that we have not delivered when we've been given the opportunity um as a sport so i think it's it's huge and i've already seen it you know here at louisville just wow okay they did that what can we do now we're not going to have a game in the football stadium anytime soon but there's a lot of great things that we can do to push the sport forward. It's absolutely true. And Mick, you had brought something up about that. Uh, you know, yeah, I, I, I had Kathy and welcome Danny. It's uh, always nice yeah. to have you on and love watching your team this year. It seems like uh, there's no let up. Uh, you got them back and you got them swinging. So it's pretty fun to watch, but coach Pettit has been out on the airways. He's pretty thrilled about the 92,000 and all of that. And he's got his own show and, we do a little battle with him still, which is really quite fun because we're all yeah. competitive. But the uh, thing he said that's very interesting is he said that coaches uh, shouldn't try to duplicate this 92,000 football stadium deal. Um, Jamie Gordon said just a little bit earlier that Dave Shondell thought maybe he'd take take a game to Indianapolis Motor Speedway and get 300,000. Uh, I don't know if Purdue could pull that off, but uh, it's interesting. But the point that Terry made and also Jared Elliott in the Monday's paper, the Austin American Statesman, was coaches should start either maxing out their facilities or moving to a bigger facility and trying to fill those down the road. Uh, you had a facility that has people lined up down the street, I mean, blocks to get get into your game. Uh, Pettit had Memorial Coliseum. Uh, Jarrett's got uh, Gregory Gym. There are other small venues between four and 6,000 that are packed full out there. Ohio State built a new one, and they're filling that at seven or 8,000. Uh, what's your thought about this uh, and the way, the way we should be moving there? Well, to be honest, at the beginning, I was very much in the camp of I want to have the best home court advantage we possibly can. And so our facility, you know, just taking Louisville as an example, our facility is small, but it's amazing. It gets really loud. It's super convenient for the players. Um, it's it's great. Um, the tickets in high demand. But I have changed my tune. I think last year we played in the Yum Center twice and had amazing crowds both times. And, you know, I've really... Uh, agree with Jared and coach Pettit that, you know, we need to, to continue to push the sport forward. You know, we should be using these other arenas, especially when we know we can get a lot of eyes on us and we're trying to play more games down in the Yum center every year. And we have great, you know, community engagement. It's helped our players. And now there's so many other things too, like NIL and all that, helps when you can get more eyes on us. So I'm in favor, you know, we're, we're here at Dayton. They have a pretty fantastic volleyball only arena, but they have a great basketball arena. It's like, it would have been cool to see, you know, what we could have done while all these schools are breaking records and not just at Louisville, but I agree everywhere we should start capitalizing on what's being built right now. 
And not only that, you've got a conference that's going to add Stanford next year. You've got Georgia Tech with a smaller arena. You've got Miami with a smaller arena, Boston College with a smaller arena. You've got a number of these smaller arenas. Has there been any talk in your conference? Because your conference is going to have five, at least five teams next year that are going to be dynamite. Uh, could be five in the top 10, I think, is the way you guys are thinking. Have you guys talked about this and how – how you can pack those arenas. I noticed Pitt, I think, is playing in their basketball arena. They draw big time every time you guys come in there. No, we haven't really talked about it as a conference or among coaches um, yet. I do think that's coming. Um, I've seen some of these other arenas recently. I saw, you know, Wake Forest built a, a new arena and they had that maxed out this past weekend. So, you know, it's just growing and growing and growing. And the good thing is a lot of schools in the ACC do have the ability to go to multiple arenas. It's just, you know, picking the right times and um, promoting it the right way. So Danny, uh, you know, in talking with Bill, you know, off, off show, uh, he had mentioned that the four programs, it was announced that the four programs in the Nebraska day uh, of volleyball, split a million dollars between four programs. What do you think about that? Yeah, uh, pretty incredible. I know that that was kind of the deal going into it. I know some of those other programs had said it would be more than their entire budget for the whole year. So I'm sure they were absolutely thrilled and um, it was pretty incredible just to be a, a part of it. You know, Bill, Bill always has all these, you know, little tidbits of information. He also mentioned to me that Texas and Stanford outperformed the WNBA game the same day on the same channel. That seems to me to be pretty, pretty telling of where volleyball is going these days. I agree. And that's why I said, I, I, it's frustrating as a coach at times, like you're so proud, but you're frustrated that everybody keeps underestimating what volleyball can do and how we can perform and um, in our own cities, on our own campuses, and on the national stage. So, you know, I think the Nebraska Day really did help open up a lot of people's eyes. And, um, again, hopefully those moments of being underestimated are coming to an end. Well, you are. You're seeing everything just grow from way back when, and it's just gaining momentum, and it's uh, it's thrilling to see. I sat there. I, I, was, I was telling you this earlier. I, I was just watching the game, and all of a sudden these tears, just without me even feeling them, started coming down because of knowing how much work has been done and how everybody's pulling together to make this type of thing work. So and thanks to all of you. you know. I think it was emotional for, yeah. for anybody who's cared about the sport, you know, yeah. and um, – uh, pretty incredible. Yeah, absolutely. So it's going to go okay with Dayton today, huh? They've got some some good ones. They do. I mean, they're always good. They're well coached and they play clean and um, their gym is on air conditioned. So we're going to have there. some, yeah. oh, wow. yeah. have some small. distractions. We and, hang over um, the edges, over the top. Yes. Too. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's a great environment though and a, a true test for a road environment. So um, I know we're going to be as ready as we can be, but it is, it is one of those stressful matches because mm -hmm. everybody's talking about these next three that we have coming up at, you know, Penn state, Kentucky, Stanford, they're um, like marquee matches for us, but Dayton is very, very good. And those so, are the ones you got to keep your eye on for sure. <laughs> yeah. You got to do, you know, play Dayton first before we even, those, those yeah. might not even matter as much if we don't get past this one. Well, well, Danny, you mentioned about Dayton's gym and the environment. And I've, I've been in that gym and played many a games, you know, in that gym, AC, uh, you know, Atlantic 10 championships and so on. Is it time for a school like Dayton to take that, take the game and move maybe a, a marquee game like, you know, Louisville yeah. against Dayton into their big arena? You know, I, I, I would say, yeah, you never know what's going on on campuses with scheduling and conflicts and, and what, um, how they're using these other arenas. You know, we run into that with the Yum Center sometimes, like a concert comes in because mm -hmm. the city owns part of that arena. So w we can only do so much. But I, I do think it's time that everybody should start looking at that and looking for opportunities um, to play marquee matches. And and I, I'm all, in again, in favor of keeping your home court advantage and you want to give your athletes the best shot to win. But again... I want to do our part and hopefully 
other coaches will start doing their part. And I'm guessing you're going to just going to see more and more games being moved to, to bigger arenas if it's available. And, you know, I have to say from a pro perspective for all this to be kind of happening and then the, the leagues starting up this this year, it's pretty exciting. And the momentum is coming from you guys and hopefully carried through from there. So Yeah, I, I hope so. I know our former athletes that are you know going to play pro in the U.S., they're super excited. And um, I saw like Nebraska, Omaha sold you know, on almost 3000 season tickets feels like that's a pretty good number yeah. this early without even playing a game yet. And mm-hmm. um, it certainly has some momentum, which is exciting. Absolutely. Well, good luck to you. We don't want to keep you too long. You probably have to get back to that scouting report or maybe talking to the team. So well, before we let it go though, Kath, I, I yeah. have one other question I'd like okay. to ask her. We have, what's your perception about the two teams, Stanford and Cal, because Mick had talked about, Stanford, you know, a little earlier. Yeah. Uh, coming into your conference, you know, what's that going to do to the enthusiasm of volleyball, you know, in the, in the ACC? And, you know, what kind of challenges, new challenges do you think that's going to bring? Well, I think it does a ton for enthusiasm, enthusiasm for the ACC. We've always, I feel like, been seen as not as good as the Big Ten and SEC is doing so much to catch up to the Big Ten. Now it's like, okay, we had Stanford and Cal and – programs that have won national championships and been in the final four. Um, It just strengthens our conference as a whole. And, you know, I, like Mick said, we could have five teams in the top 10 probably for the first time ever. Um, So it's pretty exciting from a volleyball perspective. You know, the travel is going to be interesting and I don't know, coaches are going to have to collaborate on, you know, how to make that work. I've already got a text from Salima about sharing a charter out to Cal and Stanford, um, which would actually be pretty fun, you know, when you really think about it and add a different element to to being an athlete. So at the, at the end of the day, I think it's great, and it'll be great for volleyball. I have not talked to the other coaches on campus how they feel um, from other sports, but for us, only positives. Now, I, I, it's going to – adding more great teams a little tougher to win the ACC championship, but um, we're excited to be – to add, to add those two. Well, great. Well, on behalf of the master coaches, we, we really like to thank you, Danny, <laughs> taking the time on a, on a busy day just before a match to come. And like Kathy said, we don't want to keep you any longer. Uh, we appreciate your perspective and, and it was, it was great that to have a chance to talk with you. I appreciate you guys having me. Thanks, Danny. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and move on to our buzz reaction. And, and give our master coaches a chance to comment on some of the things that we heard during the interview with uh, both Jamie and, and Danny. Mick? Well, a couple of things. <clears throat> I, uh, I had hoped maybe Jamie would be a little bit m- more forceful, but I think he's kind of feeling his way uh, in the leadership role of this. But uh, I do think he's open to discussion and open to the coaches a discussion and I think he's going to be our next great leader at the AVCA. So I thought all of the things he said were, were extremely important. Um, not much new there, but uh, we need to get him back on and ask him about these conference alignments and that sort of thing. As far as Danny's concerned, uh, I was excited to hear what she had to say. She, uh, if I read between the lines, she wants to be in the Yum Center and she thinks she can can fill it. And I think she can too. She's also excited about the quality of the, uh, uh, the ACC. Uh, she knows it's going to be tougher to win that. Jamie mentioned uh, off camera when we were talking to him, when he came on about these large conferences, they'll have 18 people in their conference now, I believe. Uh, and what that means is one team is going to win and 17 are going to lose. And when athletic directors start saying, hey, you need to win the conference, there'll be a whole nother level of pressure <laughs> going on the coaches. Uh, she didn't quite talk about that, uh, but she did mention that it will be tougher to win the conference, adding Stanford. Uh, don't know about Cal. They haven't been back up there in about eight years since Rich Feller left. So we need to wait and see uh, with those guys. Uh but uh, SMU has been playing at a pretty medium level that could uh, rise up also. So that conference is going to be uh, difficult. We need to get back with those guys 
be how they're going to manage 18 teams. It will be very interesting to see the scheduling. Well, going off that a little bit, um, just as you think about being Stanford and Cal, they have to do a lot of travel. You know, they're doing it all the time where maybe Danny and, you know, with Notre Dame, they're going there and playing and then they're done with that leg. You know, um, Stanford and Cal have to keep coming. Um, it's going to be interesting to see Big Ten, all these all these conferences, how will they manage those um, those schedules? So we'll that's yet to see be seen a little bit. But um, but I think there's a certain. Uh, it's it's really is awesome when you have so many great teams playing and you know every night is uh, so important. You can't overlook, like, I love what she said about Dayton. I mean, that's a really important match. And um, so taking care of business right now, but every night there's going to be um, that level of competition and the excitement of it. So I, I, I got to believe she's excited for that. Have you played in their basketball arena there? Uh, not in the one, well, the little one, you mean where she's playing or? No, no, no. In the, in the, young in the, in the basketball arena. I no, have played, no. I played an NC2A no. regional there. Oh, it yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been there a watching. fantastic yeah. volleyball yeah, facility. Absolutely. Everybody's tight to the court. Mm -hmm. They have one end zone that's all glass for the boosters uh, to sit. Yeah. It's a great way to promote volleyball. I thought it, I thought it was a better volleyball facility than it was basketball facility right, right. and you know they host a basketball regional or first or second round almost every year right. uh the city of dayton really goes all out wouldn't it be nice if they go out for volleyball also because they've got a facility that can really do that that game tonight if they were playing in the basketball arena i believe would sell out be full. Yeah. yeah that's why i was mentioned maybe that is the marquee match to to have there next year or the year after uh, that probably could sell out. I mean, I, I've, you know, like Dayton has a tremendous crowd coming to their existing facility. And Danny's right. It's going to, it's going to be a bond burner tonight. I think uh, just because that home court advantage. See, now, I, I worry think, about the heat of the small gym yeah. because that's where athletes get hurt early season. Uh, the floor gets wet. Uh, they get a, a overheated, spectators have problems uh, it's it's kind of a downer for volleyball when there's such a great matchup and and she's right Dayton is playing well I've been yeah, watching they're... Dayton I've seen two or three matches and he always gets them playing but they're pl this this team this year is playing really well really early and so I think this could have been a marquee match held in the uh, the main gym if if they could have worked that out so I don't know that's just my thought about it I, I kind of agree with Kathy on that and you know, you know there, will, there's a lot of um, there are a lot of volleyball programs though, that do play in the basketball arenas in their basketball arenas. I think, you know, we've got to continue to use the momentum to get out there and fan raise and fun, you know, just all of the things that go into that. And I know marketing is such a big part of it, but um, really getting the emphasis and maybe um, AD support to market it uh, as a primary sport. And putting the dollars into that, I think, will really have a nice effect, which Jamie alluded to. He said, hey, yeah, go he ahead. said, hey, not every with little effort, this is what's going on from everybody across the country. And look at the momentum built. What happens when you actually do start to put more dollars into into that um, into those into volleyball? When, when I was coaching at Texas, we yeah. played in Gregory Gym and then we played in the rec center. We drew 4,900 in 1989 in gym, and it was so hot and sweaty versus Hawaii. Hawaii was right at home because they played in Clum Gym at that time. <laughs> uh, those of us yeah. that are old enough know Clum Gym, 2,000 sweaty bodies mm -hmm. uh, right next to the floor. But every time we went to the Irwin Center, which was the basketball arena with 20,000 seats, we drew 1,500 more fans above our average draw, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no matter who we played. And mm -hmm. they weren't marquee matches that we really advertised that much. And the reason for that, I maintain, and Glenn Litsky, my assistant at the time, always kept track of this because he felt we should be in the bigger arenas, even though it wasn't as much fun for the fans early on. The, the fact that people know where to park, how to get there, what seat they want, what concession stand they're going to go to, and when they're going to leave is the key thing. And if you play in the number one arena in your town, everybody knows it's a big deal. So they all want to come. And, and I maintain if, if at, cost us, 
We had to draw 3,000 fans a night to play in the Irwin Center in the 80s and early 90s to break even. If we drew 3,000 paying fans, we break even. You were in, you were not in Breslin, but did you have an idea if you if, when you were at Michigan State to play in Breslin, what you would have to draw to break, break even if you played in that facility? I, I knew that it was ten thousand uh, dollars a match. So if you were there for a week and it was twenty grand that you had to offset, depending on your ticket prices and those types of things, what it was uh, to even it out, I don't really know because you had. You had, you know, you had to have your, um, you know, the police and the usher, just everything that you had to go in yep. and how much was volunteer versus. But I, I do know that was the number. And um, and because Breslin Center is not the basketball facility either. It is actually a Michigan State event center and uh, basketball has to rent it as well. So you kind of look at that now. Women's volleyball is currently over at the Breslin Center. So that's where they're playing. And um, so they have moved out of Jenison and done that. So wouldn't, shouldn't we advise coaches to actually check it out, see what the costs are to have an event in there one night, see what their their magic number is for spectators and make the marketing for that event each night that they play in those facilities, try to hit that number or over it so that, so that they could show that they could do a good job like that? I think it's I think it's a com combination. That's my personal opinion is like you got to get the enthusiasm there, start building it up and getting it going. Like when you were at Gregory and you were filling that up, there's an appetite to go and everybody's like hard to get a ticket. And then they moved into and that's when you got those fifteen hundred. I think there has to be a, a, a real response from the ADs to say, hey, we're going to get behind volleyball. Look at it. We're gonna, I'm going to tell everybody in these areas, marketing and everything else that, hey, volleyball is important to me. And, and and important to you know our athletic department. So get behind it. Let's start really pushing pushing to you know help build that attendance and and get the enthusiasm there. And also look at those new facilities. What you're saying, fifteen hundred. I'm saying you've got to you've got to create create some of this as well. And and well, I'm it does, talking about fifteen hundred um, over what we normally. I know. Drew. I understood what yeah, I understood yeah. what you said. I understood what you said. Yeah, and, I, I kind um, of, I, you know, Mick. I kind of agree with with Kathy, and and I don't disagree with what Terry Pettit's saying at all. But I think it, it, there needs to be steps. You know, you need to be filling your, your current facility and, and develop, you know, a buzz just about coming to the volleyball game. Uh, and, and then you make that jump into that bigger facility. And the reason I say that is because when I was at Temple University, we had an athletic director that came in. He's a great guy. He came from Long Beach State. And he immediately wanted to use the, the new facility at the time. And – it's it sat you know twenty thousand people. Uh, we weren't ready to go into that facility yet, and we went into it, and we had like fifteen hundred people come to the game, and it looked like no one was there. Uh, where if we had fifteen hundred in our current facility, it would have looked packed. And if we had been able to do that with the top down help, all right, uh, for multiple games like you had done in Gregory, then that move would have been perfect. So I, I think we, we need to be looking towards going to those big arenas with the programs that are ready to go to those big arenas. You look at Purdue. I mean, they sell out a ton and they're at a, what is theirs like 2,500 and they're ready to move up for sure. They need to be getting themselves into, you know, bigger arenas, all those people that are really, uh, you know, getting the excitement in their communities and they're getting people behind them. I think there's a lot of them that are ready to move up like Danny at being in a smaller facility. I mean, that program has outgrown, you know, um, where they're, where they're currently at, they're going to be able to build to, to do those types of things for sure. Well, Purdue is for sure ready to go into Mackey arena. For I mean, sure. I played Purdue yeah. in Mackey arena as a special That's match great. one time. Yeah. It was a great facility. It was yeah, it way fun. Yeah. You know, and, so and I thought and it's it, like right yeah. on top of you. It's good. I, I thought it was great. Yeah. I, I yeah. just, uh, Look, I think we, there's a lot, a lot of programs out the, there. Is that, that the put. facility that you were? The bench was below the court. That oh, was that's in Minneapolis. Williams. That's, that's Williams Arena. Yeah. Oh, we okay. played in Minneapolis, and it was played on a stage um, mm -hmm. in Williams Williams Basketball Arena, and we were nose to the floor. We were looking <laughs> across the floor with our <laughs> nose there. Uh, yeah. That wasn't so much fun, but uh, some people just put a chair up on the top. Yeah, they have the coach at the top. Yeah, yeah, but <laughs> take one plus me in your stand. We won two national championships at Texas in no air conditioning before we got air conditioning. We got moved up to less fans, less seats, and air conditioning uh, instead of more seats. We went to the yeah. to the rec center 
had to rent it and pay for it like we did Gregory, but got air conditioning. And that that's what we got. And I thought, I thought we got held back. I, I, if I, we could have gone to the Irwin Center, we would have done what your basketball coach did at Michigan State, Kathy. We would have bust in high school programs. Every, every Sunday at Breslin, you would see women's basketball uh, 10, 15 years ago, uh, and they would be busing in 10, 15 oh, yeah. buses full of high school kids. They created their own tr crowd, they and did. they had backing they for that. And they, they put did. money into that to develop that basketball crowd. You mm -hmm. could have done the same thing in half the time for volleyball up there had you had that kind of support. In my, my well, and opinion. they they bought they put the money behind those buses to get all those people. They yeah. had hometown heroes and they they sent the buses, but the AD paid for, you know, like they paid for those things to bring those hometowns to celebrate different athletes. I thought it was I thought it was genius. I mean, they really did pack the place and it was awesome to watch. And we did the same. I mean, we moved up and we stayed in Jenison, but our attendance went really, I mean, it, it grew um, to where we were in the top 10 in attendance for the last five, six years. Um, you know, and it was, it was great to see that grow, but it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of effort and work. And I think, you know, I, I just, I keep encouraging volleyball coaches to do that. I mean, get involved, get people to get involved and uh, build it. Um, it will happen, you know, because volleyball is such an exciting sport. Well, I'm just hoping that, you know, Volleyball Day in Nebraska, you know, opens up some AD's eyes that, you know, when they have these programs that have out, you know, outgrown their current facilities, that they're saying, hey, let's go ahead and make this move with volleyball. Uh, instead of continuing pouring more and more money into women's basketball, that's that's losing participation. Well, I think they can do both. I think it's like I, I will tell you, I felt like if we could get them in the door. Right. If they came and watched it, even if they didn't know volleyball, they were going to they were going to go away and they were going to become season ticket holders. We did. We'd bring bring different people to courtside seats. And, you know, you have the, the libero like flying into the, the person at their feet and they're they're jumping and they're athletic and everybody's starting to buy season or courtside seats that never saw the game before. And we started doing um, educational series for for fans. So they understood the game. And you just you have to be innovative and grow it, because once they start to understand and watch it. People love this sport and you can really see that with the numbers and, and what's happened in Nebraska, but not only that, but the television numbers across the board right now, you know, for volleyball to be the third most watched sport, um, that's pretty impressive. It's pretty I impressive. Think, I think that the thing that everybody has to keep in mind is that there's a large percentage of ADs who don't want more work and when Bob says take away money from women's basketball, Bob, you do a disservice to women's basketball. Well, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't no, but that's what, but that's how ADs think. Who do you want me to take the money from? And <laughs> I think, and that's what I mean by less work. I think that ADs, as we say, go talk to them. There's always going to be the AD who says, well, don't you like playing in the smaller arena with a full crowd? What he's basically saying is if we move to the big arena, I got to do more work. And do I really want to do that? That's what he's saying. Well, that that and the budget. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah. True. Yeah, I, I wasn't meaning that we should take money away from women's basketball, but we put so much Why money not? into women's sport. And, <laughs> and if you had to put half of that money into women's volleyball, how much further could it be right now? I just... I just I think it needs to be, we can all make revenue, right? It's, it's, that's the thing. And it, one of my biggest goals, I always wanted it to be, is I wanted volleyball at Michigan state to be in the black. That was important. Like, can we, can we, we have a big budget. Can we, you know, get the fans there? Can we get the fundraising there? Can we get the, all of it to kind of come together so that we're in the black? That was important. And I think you can do that. And um, I, I just know that the ADs don't mind after a while when you start to make that kind of money, but you have to have that effort pushed forward from a lot of people to make that happen. And so and you so have you to have to. People. Well, well and, and the other thing is the college coaches don't necessarily want that kind of pressure. You know, once you get your program built up and I'll, and I'll take uh, Northern Iowa. Uh, she yeah. has been wonderful out there. She's absolutely taken that program uh, after, uh, uh, Iraj was there mm -hmm. and continued to build it competitive every year. 
and all at once had a drop off. I don't know what happened, but changed uh, assistant coaches and maybe the talent wasn't there one year and the expectation was so high for her and the, the program fell down. Now she's finally got it back, but it's taken her three or four years to get that program back. And if you have to be good every year and you have one of your key players leave, like if sis left Creighton, what would that do to Creighton right there? Uh, or one of those programs that are right there with six or seven players, but not 10 or 11 great players. And so they can't afford injury or loss of a player. And they're trying to keep going. Another one is rice. Rice has been terrific the last four or five years. Now they get upset by Louisiana early in the in the second week, and they've got a whole fan base that's coming and filling that facility now at Rice. They finally have air conditioning. <laughs> fun place to play <laughs> if there's air conditioning. Not so fun. How do you not have air conditioning? Without air conditioning, let me oh. tell you. <laughs> I don't know so how you so did those that. are those are things that you know we we like to see the sport grow. Everybody wants to see the sport grow, but all at once a lot of pressure on the coaches. Let me tell you, for Pettit to advocate getting out of Memorial Coliseum, he had to coach there 24 years plus. For for Jarrett to advocate going to a 16,000-seat arena, he has to be there 21, 22 years and have great success to have enough confidence to take his program out and still think that he can win and draw more fans. So it takes, I mean, it takes coaches with gumption, right? Coaches got to have a lot of guts. Uh, and got to know that they can continue to develop and produce out there. Or otherwise, you know, it doesn't work so well for you sometimes. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and close out our buzz reaction. Uh, I just want to remind the listeners that uh, next week's show is going to be about college international mix. We're going to do both things. We're going to give you a little bit about women's college play and and how some coaches are doing double duty all right as well as talking about the international game and bill is going to educate us all on on the qualifying event and all the particulars going into this one in, in poland and we're going to bring some information to you, you all about that uh i also want to mention that next week we'll we'll talk a little bit about the master coaches college transfer showcase which is going to be held down in, in Tampa at the AVCA convention on Saturday, just before the championship match. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, next week as we get all the, you know, the particulars uh, about that event uh, on our website and then out to you all. Uh, 